Hello, my name is uh, Ja Buis. Um, I'm working as a manager of public affairs for Randstad. And we're all here together to get to know some more about STEM skills and what is needed on the labor market in Europe today. Mm. First of all, let me introduce Randstad to you. Uh, we are uh, a global uh, organization in staffing, in professionals, in HR solutions, in our services and search selection. Basically the whole scope of HR services. Um, we are the number two in the world at this moment um, with top three positions in most of European countries in Australia, Canada and also a main important role in the US and in Japan. Um, we were established in 1960. Um, we have 600,000 people working for us daily and 25,000 people working for us as fixed people. As a big, as a big HR player, um, we are very uh, interested in what's happening on the labor market and also what is uh, asked from, from the next generation to enter the labor market. For that, we have a lot of research done. Um, for the last decade, we did Bridge the Gap, we did Into the Gap, and very much more research, which you can find on Randstad.com. Um, first of all, let me tell you about the global shifts we are expecting on the labor market for the next 10, 20 years. Um, for the next 10 to 20 years, we're facing a lot of challenges. Um, we have, uh, we're dealing with an aging society, we're dealing with uh, globalization, we're dealing with uh, increasing volatility, and the increasing volatility is especially companies come and go. Uh, we had big companies like a century ago, which exist for 70 years, 100 years, 150 years, and now a company can come, arise, and in 20, 25 years, we have a complete new surroundings, environment, and we have new companies and new technology dealing with it. Uh, the same goes for the sector, sectoral shifts. Uh, manufacturing is uh, decreasing. A lot of technological uh, sectors are increasing at this moment um, because of new technology uh, facing us and everything. And from that, we find new attitudes to work from the new generations. They don't see a job anymore as a job for life. They see work as a career, as a path, as a way to fulfill their own life. Um, as a society and as business, we have to confront that situation. It brings a complete new set of challenges. Um, what we are dealing with now is uh, a mismatch between the demand and supply. We're dealing with um, a stronger segmentation of the labor market between the haves, the haves nots. We're dealing with uh, new methods of sourcing. Internet is, is uh, increasing very rapidly. New forms of labor contracts, uh, think of the own account workers, think of the all flexible labor contracts instead of the, the open-ended contracts. Uh, we're dealing with an increasing of uh, global labor migration and we're dealing with uh, work also relocating to where the talent is. It's not only where the talent goes to where the work is, but the work is also going to where the talent is. Last year we finished our latest research, which was Into the Gap. In Into the Gap we have discovered three big events approaching us up to 2020. The first one is the sectoral mismatch, which uh, is a mismatch between uh, what are people studying for at this moment, what they are applied for, and the sectors where the demand for new jobs is becoming. For instance, manufacturing is a sector which is, uh, which is falling clearly onto 2020, where technological sectors are increasing rapidly. A second one is the squeeze middle. The, the medium, uh, medium educated jobs, um, especially in administration, they are decreasing rapidly. Um, that means that, that people who are medium educated probably will have more difficulties finding a job in the next, uh, next decade and they will push out, push down basically to the bottom uh, the people who are lower educated. The third thing which we noticed was the talent gap, especially when we are dealing with STEM skills, the science, technology, engineering and mathematical skills, uh, one we are dealing with at this moment there will be a big difference between the demand and the supply of skills. Um, and that is starting today. Um, as you can see in this slide with the world map, um, you see a lot of reds in the Northern Hemisphere and in Australia, where you see the greens, for instance, in China, in India and in South America. The reds means that until 2020 and until 2030, there'll be a big talent gap. The greens means there won't be a talent gap. The problem in those countries will be employability. Let's see what it means for Europe. Europe looks red on the map and that's very clear for three reasons. The inflow, the relative inflow of, of new STEM talent will be low. 
um, it's not a very popular study at this moment and we have to popularize it a little bit more. The second reason, maybe even more important, is the replacing reason. Uh, there are large scale uh, retirements ahead, especially in STEM jobs. Um, it is expected, for instance, in the UK, that 70% of people now working in STEM jobs, in high skill STEM jobs, will be retiring until 2025 and they have to be replaced. Plus, there is a growth of those jobs. Third, Europe is not very popular with foreign students. We seem not to be very attractive to, to students from, from China and India to, uh, to come to, uh, to Europe. They mostly go to the USA, to Canada and to Australia. What does this mean up to 2020? If we look at the growth of jobs, um, the regular job growth will be about 10% for, for the normal occupations. For STEM jobs, it will be 20%, uh, double that of the normal jobs. Um, for life science jobs, it will be even 30%, and for mathematics jobs and, and computer jobs, it will be 25%. We need the people over there. We need to fill those jobs. We need to match it. In Germany, for instance, to show that it's not a, a cyclical problem, but it's a structural problem, in Germany there was a, a, a lack of STEM skilled uh, workers of 120,000 before the crisis. Then, of course, the crisis hit. The demand uh, went down a little bit. But in 2011, it went up again to that 120,000, and it is increasing at this moment. It will increase for the whole of Europe up to 700,000 in 2015, and that's only ICT jobs. We've got a gap there, especially in Europe, we've got a clear talent gap. No. Now, how can we match this gap? This one solution is, of course, to get more people into higher education. And that's also what's on the agenda for Europe in, uh, in their strategy for 2020. They want to reach 40% uh, of all uh, workers to be tertiary educated. We're not there yet. At this moment we're on one out of three more or less and uh, there's a big difference in Europe. In the north, like in Scandinavian countries, Netherlands, it's around 40% but in the south, like in Italy, it's only 20%. Especially in the south it has to increase a lot. Um, but we're not there yet with just being tertiary educated. They have to choose for STEM skills and the choice for STEM skills is not so high in, in Europe. It's one out of six of all students choose uh, science, technology, engineering or mathematics to graduate. Especially, especially it's low amongst women. 55% of all students are women, um, but in the in this typical STEM graduating uh, uh, skills, it's only 37%. That means that only one out of 10 women chooses STEM skills. Well, that's a shame. We have to reach, get it up at least to the same level as, as what men do, it's two out of 10. We have to double that. Another thing is mobility. Um, the STEM skills are there. They're there in China, where, for instance, 40% of all graduates choose STEM. They're in India, where 26% of, uh, of all students uh, choose STEM skills. The thing is that both from China and from India, they are not coming to Europe. Like I said, they are going to USA, they're going to Canada, they're going to Australia. We're just not interesting for them at this moment. So let's look at the mobility within Europe. Um, it's true that, for instance, in Southern Europe and in Eastern Europe, the choice for STEM skills is also higher than it is in the Western of, uh, side of Europe. So maybe mobility from East and Southern Europe to, to the West, to the Northwest, would help, because the demand is at the moment in, mostly in the Northwest. Um, we could encourage that. At this moment, it's, uh, it's too low. There are 600,000 students at this moment uh, studying outside their own borders. And uh, they come, especially from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, and they go especially to the UK. The UK is typically the country where, where you go and study that. Also because, of course, English is the native language over there and everybody wants to study in English. Um, this can be promoted. It can be promoted to study abroad. Uh, women can be promoted to, to, to choose more for STEM skills and, of course, the, the level of education can be increased. To do that, we have to look at what the next generation of talent wants. Now, of course, they have got a completely different view of what they want and what they want of a career um, as uh, previous generations. They want uh, opportunities, they want uh, mobility, they want freedom, they want uh, to express themselves in their jobs, in their careers. We have to see how we can deal with that. As a business, we have to see how we can deal with that. There are two big myths, for instance, about STEM skills, uh, which we have to deal with at this moment. One of them is that STEM skills do not support a broad array of career path. Um, when you choose for a STEM skill, the idea is that you are stuck in that certain uh, uh, part of, uh, 
well, basically for everything you want to do, um, which is not true. And we have to show, we have to communicate, it's not true. It's, we have to communicate that having STEM skills together with good generic skills gives you even a broader array of choices than non-STEM skills. On the other hand, it's also thought, and you notice that especially in developed countries, that um, technology is finished, it's ready. Um, there is no, there's nothing to add to it anymore, so uh, we're, we're in a service-oriented uh, uh, countries and uh, you would have to focus more on service and more than on STEM. That is not true either. Um, technology is increasing all the time, we have to show that, and also it's worthwhile, it's meaningful. Um, technology is the way, for instance, to, to stop climate change. Technology is the way to green jobs and to improve uh, the environment and to have a meaningful career. Um, so what we have to remember, what we have to take out of this is the, the need for STEM skills starts now. Um, uh, looking at the, at, the, at aging, at the aging society, looking at the demand from, from society, the, the demand for STEM skills starts now. Uh, we have to promote and we have to promote women to choose for STEM skills. We have to promote mobility. If you want a job, if you want a good job at STEM skills, look, look across your border. Don't be stuck to, to your own country, but look if there are other countries where you could find a good study, a study which brings you on the career that you want. But also let's have a look like, how do you promote the, 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 the chance? How do you promote STEM skills to your students? Um, because they do think that it's, it's a very limited career choice. They do think it, it's not meaningful. Tell them it is not a limited career choice. Together with that generic uh, competences, they can go anywhere with STEM skills. And also it's meaningful. You can go anywhere and you can do something for the country in green jobs, in uh, climate change, in anywhere you want. That's the thing we have to tell that generation which is coming now. Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the rest of the course.